Four years ago, I was a struggling commercial director, not having too much success. And um, my partner decided that he wanted to call it quits. So we broke up the company, and I went back home, told my wife that I was no longer in a partnership. And she said to me, well, cut the crap. What do you really want to do with your life? And um, I said, I really want to make my film. I mean, I've been writing different screenplays for eight years, and none of them ever seemed to come to fruition. So, fuck it, I'm going to do my film. And she's like, do it. So, I pretty much went in and made this film, and it broke, like, all the records. I never saw this coming. And then people started to dress up as my characters for parties, they started to mock political leaders in the same style of the film. It was quickly selling out on DVDs and uh, also in box office movie theaters. Then the Wall Street Journal even ran an article about what the social disparity that we were criticizing in the film. And of course, it was all done in good humor and with a lot of love. I don't know really how I did this. I guess that there are no formulas for this, but there are principles that I guess apply to all sorts of fields. So I decided to label this Nine Unlikely Teachers because they are ideas that came out of nowhere and they helped me make my film. I hope to share it with you and you can all reach your dreams also. So the first unlikely teacher was watching Dragon's Den. It made me fantasize of the time when I would stand in front of whoever this potential investor might be. And I started to notice from, from the show that the people who could actually just explain their idea in a very clear and simple way that made it feel like it was new, they made it. And like I said, the big question is, what is the big idea? Regardless of whether you're doing a restaurant, a book, or designing a new iPad, Rival, or whatever, you're, you want the person to understand what it is that you're doing. Second unlikely teacher was T.S. Eliot's famous quote, immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better. Which, Picasso said it much simpler when he stole it from T.S. Eliot, saying, bad artists copy, good artists steal. And then Woody Allen, went a bit further and said, strive for originality, but if you cannot find it, steal and steal from the best. But it takes us to this next piece of insight, which is that all first drafts are shit. And the reason why this is so is because it's very obvious to detect what you stole. And there is a process to making it your own, which is understanding it better and coming closer to it and you have to be willing to kill your babies when you're when you're trying to create something because you're understanding it and you're daring to let go of the initial ideas that sparked you into this journey and in the process of letting go of those ideas you find the new ones and that's the process where it starts to become your own now i know i know what the hell is simon cowell doing up here but it was fascinating that American Idol reached a point where nobody really cared what Paula Abdul or the other guy said to the artist. It was all about what would Simon say? And if Simon liked it, then everyone was thrilled, right? And I started to realize that we have too many Paula Abduls in our lives. They are your aunts and sisters who are really proud that you took on this endeavor and they cheer you on because it's so great that you're doing it. But the truth is that Simon judged them the way that we should judge our, our own work. And that is, you have to compete with the best. And that does not mean the best of the contest. It means Madonna. It means Lady Gaga. It means the people that already made it. And Simon would only let those through who came close enough to those guys. And I guess that that pretty much started to define a bit of what was the standard with which I was developing the film. I mean, at the end of the day, I could stand in front of the people during the tour press and go, oh, 
it was my first film and support Mexican cinema and you know um, we did it with a lot of love and people really have an hour and a half and 50 pesos and you have to give them a reason to really pay for your ticket as opposed to doing it out of charity so I guess that Simon Cowell was a, a defining force in my life because uh, I had to really be very strict about my standards when I was making the choices during the film. Now, the next teacher, and this one is one that I really venerate. I don't know if you saw this documentary of Hito Dreams of Sushi. But this guy was rated three-star Michelin uh, chef in the world. And normally, the majority of these chefs are in the French cuisine because it's a sophisticated cuisine, and so many ingredients can go into it that there's a wide range of creativity. But how the hell do you go from this to this? I mean, how does someone really recognize the difference between that sushi and, no, we have to give three stars to this guy, right? And he has such attention to detail. You know, he was saying, I am never satisfied with my work. And when you see his process, he buys from the best uh, suppliers of rice. He has a guy massaging an octopus for 45 minutes before he actually cuts it up and feeds it to you. He, he puts on the bar a whole people who are left-handed and the right-handed people so that their elbows aren't hitting against each other. He, he makes the pieces of sushi smaller for the women than for the men because their mouths are smaller, so he doesn't like to see them like stuff the fish in her mouth. And he is striving for something that the Japanese call umami, which is that sensation that you get that simply your mouth sparkles when you put that piece of food inside your mouth. And I guess that there's a big importance to naming your objective. If you can clearly understand the sensations, thoughts, and emotions that you want the people who are going to use whatever it is that you're going to create, then you know what you're striving for. And the story of how I determined what I wanted was because um, uh, we have this quirky New Year's tradition where my wife and I buy each other un underwear. And uh, white underwear is for health. Uh, yellow underwear is for, for money. And red is for love. So we were making our film and my wife is like, Honey, this is your year, you know, you, yellow. <laughs> and, and I was like, no, 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 no. I want red. I want people to love my film the way I loved the films that I saw when I was a kid. I want them to quote my lines. I want them to dress up as my characters. I want to be walking down a Halloween party one day and see this guy dressed like one of my characters. That is what I want. And it happened. Right? So, so I guess that that is an important thing. Naming your objective is quite important. Now, I, I love this quote, which is, to lead people, walk behind them. One of the things I did while choosing my crew for this is that, first of all, it's a collaborative thing. And the people that I chose are the people that would have been already in movies that did over a hundred and million pesos. That's, what, that's the goal that I wanted. That's the quality of film that I wanted. And I wanted people that understood how to do those films in my crew, right? Which created a bit of a ironic thing. I mean, I'm the director, theoretically, in hierarchy. I'm the guy with the most authority. But I was the most unexperienced guy on the set. So I had to flip the, the triangle. And instead, I would sort of ask them, like, um, all right, th well, this is what I want to do, so how do I do it? And people started to tell me, and that way we created this conversation where I just sort of said, uh, we want to go here, you know, and, and these people just did it for me. And everyone was an expert except me. And, and I guess that this flipping of the pyramid was something that helped me a lot, and I hope and it's, it's an insight that, that I want to share with you because... I think it's great. I mean, if, if you can really stick to that, it'll make a difference. Now, pretty much the thing about leading and being in, the, in front is that you chose to be there, you know? Um, 
no endeavor will ever, ever be easy. No task that you want to do, no business that you want to make, no uh, scientific barrier that you want to cross will be easy. The people are difficult. The funding is not, never the same. The time is never enough. The location wasn't the ideal one. These things are, you, you should take this for granted. And whenever anything goes wrong, even if you weren't even in the set or you weren't in the lab and something went wrong, it's your responsibility. At some level, it's your responsibility. And the more you own that, the less of a victim you become. And you can keep calm and carry on. Now, I was able to go with a friend of mine to HBO, and my friend snuck me into this presentation where Richard Pepler, the, the CEO of HBO, sat in front of us and just outlined this whole philosophy of how he ran HBO. And I mean, yeah, he knew numbers, he knew story, he knew Wall Street, he knew technology, but when it came down to it, he was talking about the definition of success. You see, how do you know when you're successful? How will you know you succeeded? If you are defining your choices by the outcomes that you wish to receive, the awards you want to get, the prizes you want to achieve, then you're focusing on the result. And that tends to make you second guess the audience, second guess the consumer. And it puts you out of the equation because now you're doing the thinking for your consumer. And it's pretty hard to guess what on earth everyone wants. So the best thing you can do is put the process as the success, not the results. If you can put a name on the indicators of what is a successful process, then you know what to do the next time. And you know where you, in what parts of the process you failed and in what part of the process you succeeded. And when it came to me, I finished my film and I screened it one last time before doing the premiere. And I was able to open-heartedly turn to my producer and tell him, hell, I would buy this DVD. You know, I would put this in my collection. And that's how I knew that the process worked. Um, and then it, it, it worked with the audiences. It connected. But if the next one, I want to lie down and say, well, now I can do whatever I want, then, then you're screwed because it's the process that works. It's not the end result. Chris Rock. You know, success might be defined by the outcome of your projects, but I don't really think so because there's a big difference in the words of Sir Chris Rock between having a job and a career. And I guess that my favorite story is about a doctor who, when he was at his funeral, I saw his daughter resentful of the little time she, she spent with, his, with her father, saying, you know what? I mean, he did all, re all his research on cancer and whatnot, and he never cured it. You know, what a fuck up. And the grateful son, who was also a workaholic like his dad, I was like, no, no, hell no. I mean, dad woke up every day and used every bit of his creativity and of his knowledge and of his connections to try to figure out a way of curing cancer. I don't care if he actually cured it or not. His life had a meaning for him. And I guess that that's the most important thing because... Uh, it, some projects will succeed, others will fail, and who cares? The important thing is that you're happy and passionate about what you're doing. So I guess that's my TEDx presentation, and um, I hope you enjoy it.